Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman, and we're taking a look today at the HP Pavilion X360 14. This is a two-in-one, so it works as a tablet in addition to working as a laptop. And of course, you've got uh, tent mode and display mode on it as well. And of course, it is a touch display because it is a two-in-one. Uh, this one also comes with a pen in a few of the configurations too. And we'll be checking all of this out here in just a second. Now, I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure, this is on loan from HP. So when we're done with this, it goes back to them. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own. Nobody is paying for this review, nor is anyone reviewing or approving what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see what this laptop is all about. Now, the price point on this will vary widely based on your configuration choices and where you buy it from. At the moment, and I'm not sure how long this sale will go on for, uh, this one as configured is selling for about $570 on HP's website, and I'll put a link to that down below in the video description. I'm not sure again how long that sale lasts, but it looks like it's pretty reasonably priced at the moment, and it even comes with a pen too. Uh, this one has a 1080p IPS touch display. This is uh, really nice, good viewing angles, great color on it. Nice and bright too, about 250 nits, which isn't bad for a display at this price point. You of course will find brighter displays on more expensive laptops, but I was quite pleased with it. Uh, there's another version that has a 720p display that costs a little bit less, but I really think the 1080p is the sweet spot here, and I would recommend going up to that. Now these are powered by Intel processors, 10th generation chips. Uh, this one has an i5-1035G1, but there's also an i7 version with G7 graphics, which will be much better for gaming. So if you do plan to play some games on this, I would spend a little bit more for that i7 version, and you'll see some games running on this one in a few minutes. Another suggestion I have is spending a little bit more on the memory. Uh, the review loaner we got has eight gigabytes of RAM, but on this model, the eight gig model is in single channel configuration. There is one memory module, and for these Intel laptops with the built-in graphics, when you have two modules, you can put the laptop into dual channel memory mode and you'll have better graphics performance as a result. So the 16 gig version has two eight gig modules, which will give you better graphics performance. This one's not bad, but it could be better with that 16 gigs of RAM inside. Now you can upgrade the RAM on this, HP tells me, uh, but you'll have to take it apart to do so. It's not hard but the rubber feet here have to be removed to get at all the screws. So you'll have to put these rubber feet back on and they don't always go back on the same way. So just bear that in mind. It's not designed to be user serviceable. Uh, this review unit has 256 gigabytes of NVMe SSD storage. It's very zippy. And it also on top of that has 16 gigs of Intel Optane memory, which will speed up application loading as well. So it's a pretty slick little machine here for uh, doing the basics like web browsing and word processing and that sort of thing. Uh, applications will load up pretty quickly on here and you shouldn't see a lot of delay between a mouse click and when something boots up for you. Now the weight on this one is 3.5 pounds or 1.6 kilograms. Feels nice and sturdy even though it is made out of plastic for the most part. Uh, the keyboard deck here though is aluminum and it's got a nice solid feel to it and this does add some rigidity to the overall structure here. Uh, the hinge is very nice, it stays put for the most part. You can get the display positioned anywhere you want and of course you can flip it around and put it into tablet mode. Uh, the keyboard isn't bad either, nice big keys, well spaced. Uh, this one lacks a fingerprint reader and a backlit keyboard, but there are versions that have fingerprint readers and backlit keyboards if you prefer that. I believe the silver version has the backlighting on it. This one doesn't. Uh, the trackpad here feels nice. It's nice and large. It's a click pad. Feels very sensitive and uh, no complaints on that front, so all good on the input. Uh, it does have a 720p webcam here at the top. Nothing spectacular, but this will be fine for Zoom. The Intel chips do really well for uh, video conferencing. So if you have a kid who's going to be doing a lot of uh, synchronous learning online with their uh, webcams, this one should do fine for that. And there's a good port selection on this one. You've got a bunch of USB ports. One is on the left here. This is a USB 3 Gen 1 port running at five gigabits per second. You got your headphone jack there. Uh, there is an exhaust for the fan, which we'll discuss in a little bit. 
On the other side, you've got a spot for a SIM card because some of these support 4G LTE, so you can hook it up with your favorite cellular provider and be able to use the data everywhere you go. Uh, next to it is an SD card slot, and what's nice about this is that the SD card sits flush to the case, so you can load up a bunch of movies and stuff on your removable media here and take it with you. That might be useful. The hard drive inside is upgradable, but it's often nice to just be able to augment the storage with an SD card and leave it in there, which you can do on this one. Uh, next to it, you've got a USB Type-C port. This is a Gen 2 port running at 10 gigabits per second, according to HP, and it's a full service port, so you can use this not only to plug data devices in, but also connect up external displays and or connect power as well. So you can charge it through the USB-C port here or through the barrel connector here at the end. That's really nice to see. If you've got a USB-C docking station, you can plug it right in there and you're good to go. Just note that this does not support Thunderbolt, just USB-C. You've got another USB-3 port over here. This one is a five gigabit port. And then the HDMI, HP says they upgraded to HDMI 2.0 over the prior edition. HDMI 2 should give you up to 4K at 60 frames per second on the output. So decent port selection here, good I.O., and I really like having the full-service USB-C port on this one. So let's take a look and see how it performs. We'll load up the NASA.gov homepage here real quick and see how fast that boots up here. Now we're on my wireless AC network here at the house. Uh, there is a Wi-Fi 6 option on this if you want the faster Wi-Fi. Uh, but AC here for me seems to be working just fine, so all good on that front. A little bit earlier, we also booted up some YouTube videos and we played back my 60 frames per second 1080p file that we like to run from YouTube. And we had no drop frames, very smooth performance here, and no issues to report on that front. So I think for doing the basics like web browsing and word processing and spreadsheets, this is more than adequate even in its single channel configuration. And on the browserbench.org speedometer test running in Google Chrome, we got a score of 186 on version 1.0 of that test and 109.3 on version 2.0. That comes in right around where I would expect this chip to come in at. And you can also see it compared to a previous generation i5 processor as well. It does a little bit better against that one. So all in performance, at least for web browsing, feels about where it should be. Let's take a look now at its pen performance. All right, so we've got the laptop now in tablet mode, and you can see you've got a ton of screen real estate to work with here for writing. Now, one thing I like to do is make sure that the pen gets detected before I rest my wrist down and begin writing here. But as you can see, it is ignoring my wrist input, and all seems to be working pretty well. Uh, one thing that I like to look for as I write out my name is whether or not it loses track of the pen in between the letters, especially if I lift my pen up too high from the screen. But it looks like it's doing a good job of keeping track of the pen's location. And you can test for that by looking and seeing where that cursor under the pen shows up as it gets closer. But I didn't see too many uh, wrist movements here getting detected as I was writing things out during my testing. It also supports pressure. So if you do a light line here, you get one type of line. And if you push down harder, you get a darker line. Uh, this pen that they sent as part of my review loaner is a 2.0 version of the Microsoft Pen Standard that also supports tilt, where you can get a thicker line if you hold the pen at an angle, although the apps that I typically use for this don't seem to support that just yet. But it looks like you'll have additional writing capabilities here with the new Pen Standard. I'm not sure if you get this pen, though, in the box with the pavilion that we're looking at here. Uh, I will update down in the comments section if that is the case. All right, so let's move on to some more fun stuff, gaming. And we ran a bunch of games on this just to see how things went. Uh, this is Fortnite running at 720p at the lowest settings. And the frame rate was varying quite a bit. It would go as high as 50 frames per second and as low as the upper 20s. So I think about 30 frames per second here is the average that we were experiencing. Not bad, but again, you would see better performance if you had two sticks of RAM installed. Uh, we also took a look at Rocket League, 720p here, lowest settings, just like we did for Fortnite. We were getting between 25 and 50 frames per second, quite a variation here as well. Uh, Rocket League is not all that forgiving of single channel memory configurations, and this is a good example of that. 
but it's still playable and it would be a little more playable if you went with the 16 gigs of RAM. GTA 5, same story. We were running 720p, lowest settings, getting between 20 and 30 frames per second. I should note, though, that in the past, we never got this kind of performance out of Intel graphics. So things have actually gotten a lot better uh, over the years here with the built-in Intel stuff. Uh, we also ran The Witcher 3, 720p. Here we were in the 20 frames per second territory, not as playable. Uh, but if you go into some older games like Half-Life 2 at 1080p, we were in the hundreds of frames per second here. So there's a lot of stuff that will run really nice on this if you don't mind playing some older games. And that's often the case with machines running with Intel graphics. Now we're going to pivot over to some benchmarks. And this will be a good opportunity to see what dual channel memory would look like and also what going to the i7 with the G7 graphics would look like as well. Let's take a look at the 3D Mark CloudGate test. And we got a score of 8,129 on that test. And take a look at the Acer Swift 3. Its graphics performance in dual channel memory mode was about 10 frames per second faster than what we're seeing out of this pavilion. I would expect that we would get similar performance out of this machine if you had both of those memory banks populated, and that's an argument for going to the 16 gigs of RAM. Another thing to check out is the Lenovo at the top of the chart there. It's running with the i7 processor that has the G7 Iris graphics, and check it out. It is much faster, and that is definitely something to consider on the pavilion here if you are looking to play some games on it. So you'll see a definite performance boost if you go up to that G7 variant here for gaming for sure. Now we also ran the 3D Mark stress test, and that is a test that runs one of these benchmarks over and over again to see how the computer does under load for an extended period of time. There we got a score of 93.7%. That is a failing grade, passing is 97%. So that indicates to me that you might see some variation in gaming performance and other stressful tasks if you are stressing the processor constantly. Uh, and that's something that we often see on lower price laptops and that's no exception here. I do recommend making sure that you keep the bottom of the laptop clear along with the side here because that's where the airflow needs to go to keep things cool. Uh, the good news is, though, that the fan noise on this is not very loud. The fan doesn't kick on all that often, so most of the time you won't hear it. Uh, so that's good, but there will be some fan noise every once in a while. Uh, by the way, while you're gaming, you've got upward firing speakers on this one, which is great when the laptop is in laptop mode, but it might sound a little muffled when you have it uh, down in display mode like this. So I think if you are watching movies and want to have it in the display format here, you might want to attach some headphones or use some Bluetooth speakers. Uh, the speakers overall don't sound bad. They are Bang & Olufsen branded speakers. Uh, they do have good stereo separation, but you're not going to get a lot of bass out of them. But they do sound pretty good for a laptop at this price point. All right, one last thing to check out here, and that is its Linux compatibility. Uh, the good news is that the display, including touch, is being detected properly. Wi-Fi, audio, Bluetooth, all of that is good. Uh, but the keyboard here is not getting detected. And this is the second two-in-one I've looked at over the last couple of days uh, that wasn't getting its keyboard working with Ubuntu 20.04. So I wonder if there's some driver update coming down to fix all of that. And it might have something to do with transitioning the, key, the computer out of tablet mode into laptop mode again. I did try to flip the display around a few times, but I was not able to get this thing to get the keyboard detected properly. So that'll probably get resolved at some point. Otherwise, it looks like it is pretty compatible here with Linux. And overall, I think it's a nice little machine here, uh, pretty reasonably priced depending on where you buy it, when you buy it, and what's inside of it. There are a ton of configuration options as we went over. And again, I think if you get yours with 16 gigs of RAM, you will see better graphical performance. And I would strongly recommend that, especially if you're going to go up to the i7 version that has the better graphics option. And it's good to see that there is a good graphics option with this and overall, a nice solid machine from HP. That's going to do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Tom Albrecht, Chris Allegretta, David Hockman, Brian Parker, Mike Patterson, 
and Bill Pomerantz. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.